podcast. I'm Sadika, your host. Today I want to talk about myself. Surprise, surprise. Um, basically, I just want to give you a rundown of the experience that I've had in and on my spiritual journey and what that means to me, the types of spirituality that I, I've dabbled in, the different traditions that I've embraced and sometimes abandoned, um, the different techniques that I've used along the way, the different experiences that I've had, and just the whole smorgasbord that is Sadika. Okay, so I'm 42 years old. I was born in San Diego, California. Proud San Diegan, not a proud Californian, just gotta say it. Um, and I was raised a Jehovah's Witness. So from a very early age, I had it inculcated into my being everything Bible, everything Jesus, everything Jehovah, which is what they call God, obviously, another way to pronounce Yahweh, supposedly. Interesting side note, I've actually watched something recently that claims that the actual pronunciation of God's name, which we usually think of as Yahweh, is Yehovah. Um, it was from a, some rabbinical texts and old texts or whatever. They actually encode by clues the way to pronounce it. They say you're supposed to use this vowel as in this word, and they actually give the vowel, and you're supposed to use this vowel as in this word, and they give that vowel, and it comes out to Yehovah. So I think that's interesting. In that sense, the Jehovah's Witnesses have something slightly right, um, but if you just think that they're a regular brand of Christianity, a regular Christian sect or, or denomination, you would be wrong. And I do apologize to people who might be listening to this who are a part of the Jehovah's Witness organization, but I do not believe that they represent in any way the teachings of Christ. And if anybody knows anything about recent Jehovah's Witness history, they'll know that Basically, just the, in the way that the Catholic Church has been not just accused of, but it has been proven, obviously, that there has been rampant abuse, child abuse, um, abuse of power and control in general for years and years and years and years. The same thing is happening with the Witness Organization. The same thing is happening with the, um, the Latter-day Saints and a lot of religious institutions in general. Let's just lump them all together and say, hey, any any system that is about control of you, of your body, and, and these people try to be intercessors between you and a higher power, they are apparently, or supposedly, uh, God's messengers on earth, or God's sort of governing body, that's the word that they use in the Jehovah's Witness organization, you are beholden to them, and so they have the power, they have the control, and so they can manipulate and they can abuse people. And there has been all kinds of information coming out in the past, you know, decade plus, I guess I would say, about the abuse in the Jehovah's Witness organization. So I'm sorry to be controversial, I didn't start the fire. Um, that's up to everybody else who is a filthy abuser. Uh, I was never abused um, in that particular manner, but it is a long history of control and abuse in a spiritual sense, in a psychological sense. To try to paint you a picture, I never thought I was going to get to be a teenager. Okay, I'll get to the point in a minute. I never thought I was going to have to get a job. I never thought I was going to have any going to have to have any type of education beyond the education that I got in the church, which they call a kingdom hall. Um, and of course, I only went to school, my brother only went to school because the government told us that we had to. Jehovah's Witnesses would be very happy to just quote-unquote educate their children at home with no interference from any outside officials whatsoever. That is not possible in this country. You will face problems from the powers that be if you attempt to do that with your children or with anybody else. Um, so I was homeschooled my entire life, and I didn't even understand why I had to do that, you know? And it wasn't just a sense of, oh, you know, higher education is wrong, 
which there is a sense of that, so you were never encouraged to go to college. I went to a trade school. There was also a sense of, well, why are we learning anything from outside the Jehovah's Witness organization? This is obviously from the devil, you know? Like, I don't want to be influenced by all of these evil worldly people and their ways... I don't know about their ways, but you always are suspicious of anybody who is not a Jehovah's Witness. You are taught to specifically be suspicious of everyone who is not a Jehovah's Witness. I never had friends who were not witnesses. Um, you have to understand the type of exclusion, the type of isolation that is part and parcel with a organization, an organization like this. There are many other organizations out there. From an outside perspective, you would just look at that kid and he would be or she would be in public school and you would probably think, oh, they're a little weird. They don't celebrate birthdays, but that's just their religious practice. If you're super young, if you're a fellow child, you're like, oh, that's stupid. Why don't you get to have fun on Christmas and man, 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 and that kind of thing. And it makes us feel really embarrassed and humiliated, but we just go home and tell our parents and they come back to us, well, that's just more proof that we are God's people and you should be encouraged and happy and proud because you're one of God's chosen people, the Jehovah's Witnesses. And I think that that's pretty freaking dangerous. I never thought about falling in love. I never thought about getting married. Again, I never thought about getting a job. I never thought about growing older because you're taught from from the time you are conceived essentially that if you're a good Jehovah's Witness you will survive Armageddon which is coming tomorrow by the way and you will live forever on a paradise earth that's the main message that's the main dogma I guess uh, especially nowadays as you find the real theology, the real meat of the religion has almost completely been stripped away from what it used to be. There are things that I loved dearly as a Jehovah's Witness growing up, books that I read over and over and over again. I was really obsessed with this book that we had on the book of Revelation. Um, you know, God's revelation to John in the Bible. I don't know why. <laughs> of all things for of all things for a child to be obsessed with in a spiritual or religious fashion, the apocalypse seems like the least interesting thing. You know, it's like I don't know. I was I was just obsessed. I was obsessed with this book that we had about God's revelation to John and that now is considered apostate material. It is considered you oh ooh you cannot have that book. It's bad. It's evil. It's just as bad as you know anything that comes from outside the organization because it's just it's just old information and they've gotten new light. That's a, another thing that you will see they use what essentially boils down to a form of neuro linguistic programming. So the actual doctrine is called the truth, like with a capital T. Everything that is not part of the witness organization is called the world. They even define the term Christendom, which just means the whole of Christianity to most Christians, as everything that's not a Jehovah's Witness Christian, and all of those things are evil. This is another line of thinking that you will find in the Jehovah's Witness organization, which is not, not endemic to all Christian denominations or sects. Most denominations you go into and they'll say, and you could say, oh, I'm Episcopalian, but I just wanted to come and check out your Baptist, you know, they'll be like, oh, okay, you know, like, well, this is what we're about. This is how we worship. This is what we do. They might not necessarily say, you're going to hell because you're not a Baptist. I'm sure some people would say that, you know, the more fu fundamentalist nut jobs or whatever. But in, a, in a, a real sense, the crux of Jesus' message was acceptance and love. At least it was supposed to be. And so most other Christian congregations, if you're curious about their stuff, they will welcome you. Jehovah's Witnesses will always welcome you too. But they believe that all other Christians are evil. 
All right. So that's not normal in other forms of Christianity, I don't think. So you can see how it's it's very veiled. Once again, from the outside, from an outside perspective, witnesses seem very open and friendly and loving, and they are to a degree. As soon as you are a witness, they're even more friendly to you and more welcoming. The love bombing starts, which is a, a term that people bring up a lot in cults. You go into, a, as a curious person, into a kingdom hall, and people will be bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, and they'll come up to you, and they'll shake your hand, and they might even give you a hug, and be like, oh my gosh, welcome, you know, you're in the right place, this is what it's all about, and it feels very good. And people get absorbed and absorbed and absorbed, and then the other things start. By the way, you have to not talk to your entire family for the rest of your life unless they become Jehovah's Witnesses too. By the way, um, even if any one of us whom you just met, you become friends, you become lovers eventually, you get married or whatever, if that person decides to leave the organization, you are also to have nothing to do with them. It makes for some very tricky situations because when I got kicked out uh, at 18 years old, my sins that I was accused of were homosexuality and smoking. Gonna let that sink in for a bit. I have absolutely no idea how in anyone's mind, religious or otherwise, such things could be conflated with each other. Like, I'm just puffing on a cigarette, and that's just as evil as homosexuality to them. I mean, I don't think that either of those things are evil. L let me be clear about that. However, <laughs> they're just not on par, like, in anyone's mind, you know? Like, there, there has to be some type of degree of sin. But now that I've given you a rundown of how horrible that entire organization can be, and this is not an episode just on the Jehovah's Witnesses. I know I've spent... 13 minutes, just looking at the clock here, talking about them. But this is the organization from which I came. The other side of it is a deep love of what they consider to be God. I was balls out crazy in love with God growing up. From the time I was born, huh, I would get my favorite book. It was called My Book of Bible Stories. And I would preach to the neighbor kids. You know, it wasn't like a, a big old sermon or whatever. I just was doing what I knew. I was just trying to share with them how wonderful God was and how wonderful Jesus was and how awesome the Bible was and how amazing these stories were. You know, the the Good Samaritan and Jonah and the whale and, and you know, the story of, I don't know why Jezebel comes to mind. It's just one of the pictures, the paintings that was in that book that really stands out to me. I mean, the bitch looked fierce, let's be honest. Lots of painted eyes, you know, kind of this like, yeah, you get it. Elizabeth Taylor, that's what I'm thinking. And I remember once, and when I was doing that, I was four years old. Four years old, preaching the word to the neighbor kids with my little book. And I remember once this neighbor kid comes up and he's like, oh, I had that book. I tore all the pages out of it. And I was like mortally wounded. You know, I had no idea how or why anyone would be so disrespectful to something so holy, to something so sacred. And I know this might sound ridiculous to some people, but I'm just trying to impress upon you the type of person that I was, the type of kid that I was, the type of spirit that I had and that I still have to this day. There was just this deep sense of the sacred within me. So what was presented to me as sacred, I was going to take that on face value. This is a sacred object. This is a sacred text. Maybe not my book of Bible stories, but it was about a sacred text. And I didn't have a concept of, of what it meant to be disrespectful back then, but I was seeing this behavior and hearing what this kid was saying to me, and I was just shocked, you know, I'm like, why would you do that? Like, this precious, beautiful book, how dare you? You know, I was a very strange little kid. Witnesses are also very studious, and so you're encouraged to take notes every time you go to church, and I would, to the best of my ability. As soon as I could write well, I was taking notes. But even before that, I was copying the name of God uh, YHWH, 
in Hebrew and Aramaic, like over and over and over again, even accounting for the fact that the letters went backwards from the way they were teaching me to write English in school. Um, and I just thought it was cool, you know, I, I, I was just writing God's name over and over, and I would write it in different ways, and I would write it in different styles, I would copy it, like outline it, like I was drawing it, and fill it in in different colors or whatever, this was like, this was it for me, that began also my lifelong love of language, and words, and a deep and heartfelt appreciation of scripture in general. Of course, that scripture was limited to Christian and or Jewish scripture. I didn't even know about, you know, rabbinical texts or anything outside of the Torah or whatever at the time, you know. But it was just, it was so sacred and amazing and special to me, especially if it was in a different language. I remember we had a copy of the Septuagint and it was in English and Greek right next to each other. And I was just marvel at the at the letters and I wanted to read these texts in the original languages and I wanted to learn Hebrew so badly. It's just, again, not normal for a little kid, I would say. So with all of that going through my little heart, there was also another very strange undercurrent, which was magic. I don't know where the concept came from. To me, everything that you saw as a kid that was like, you know, the sword and the stone, Merlin, Dungeons and Dragons type magic, that was just all fantasy to me. I don't know that I ever got it in my head that I was trying to be like... I want to say Harry Potter, even though I was much older when Harry Potter came out. I grew up in the 80s and 90s, a mythical time that no longer exists. Certainly I knew the concept of magic. I also knew that the practice of magic as a form of spirituality, I guess, was evil in Jehovah's Witness terms. What I saw on TV, to me, was not evil. It was just fantasy. It's like X-Men, mutant powers, or whatever. And yet, at the same time, when I was like five to seven years old, I would sit on the beach, the shore, in Mexico, and I would draw with a stick weird swirly figures in the sand, and I would stare up at the clouds expecting them to change I, I i still to this day cannot fathom where i got that from or what i really thought i was doing but i obviously thought that my actions had some effect on the world around me this is a very important point when it comes to magic when it comes to spiritual traditions such as nogualism the traditions of the Toltecs or the Mashika, uh, which is something that I belong to, a tradition that I belong to, at least cursorily, and many of the practices that I engage in um, and that you will hopefully become familiar with if you sign up for Naona X, which is my exclusive podcast and live streams and spiritual workshops. So I just got to get that little plug in there. It also reminds me of Crowley's idea of magic being, creating things, making things happen in accordance with one's will. That's what I feel like I was doing. I was trying to make things happen according to my will. When I started to develop more of an ego, it was more obvious to me. I was trying to do telekinesis, you know, but from a much younger age, I didn't it was just always there, like the, the magic connection, like the creating the world around me by doing other things, at least trying to, was always there. Always. Then after I knew exactly what to call it, I, st I started trying to do it on purpose, you know. So if there was like, I spilled water on the floor and it was like, you know, puddling and then streaming in a certain direction, I would, I would sit there like with my hand over it, like trying to stop it from moving, you know. I think that kind of thing is pretty normal for a kid. Uh, I sometimes wonder if it really does harken back to a sort of genetic memory, like or a spiritual memory, maybe it has nothing to do with genes, um, to a time when we could do these types of feats, you know, beyond the physical. I don't know. 
but it was always there. And so I sort of had this longing for magic, for a sort of mysticism and a deeper connection to the divine than I was being provided in the Jehovah's Witness organization. Uh, I did not get baptized. This is another little JW fact. Um, you don't get baptized until you feel that you're ready. I personally never understood why a kid as young as like eight years old would get baptized. This is very different from most Christian organizations in which you're either like in a Catholic baptism, you are baptized at birth, you know, even if you never go to church again, as long as you're not actually excommunicated, <laughs> You can still call yourself a Catholic. You have been baptized. You can be, I think, pretty much assured that you'll still get into heaven according to their rules. Maybe, maybe not. Other people have different ideas about that. I'm not exactly sure. Other denominations of the Christian church, I'm not exactly sure when the baptism happens. But I did not get baptized until I was 16, I believe. Maybe even 17. Uh, because I wanted to be sure within my own heart and my own mind, that this is what I wanted to do. This is what I wanted to be for the rest of my life. I do remember um, singing the songs just before I got baptized. And just so you know, I got baptized in front of like 20,000 people. <laughs> so that's fun. Uh, because I was a chubby little gay boy, and I did not like taking off my shirt. But I still had to, uh, you know, get in the changing room. I don't really remember it, honestly. It was just this weird experience, and they kind of, like, rush you out there, and there's still, like, music playing, and there's this big pool in the middle of the freaking Jack Murphy Stadium. At least that's what it used to be called. I think now it's called Qualcomm. With about 22,000 people, some odd people, and I remember standing there singing the song just before we were about to go down to the thing and change and go get dunked. And I was crying, you know, during the whole song because it really was in my heart that I was doing the right thing, that I was committing myself to this way of life, to this group of people. And you feel so much fellowship when you're surrounded by 20,000 other people, even when it's just a small local congregation and there's, you know, maybe, maybe 100 people there on a given Sunday or whatever. And you just, you feel so special. There's all these people. They all believe the same as you. You can catch a glance across a crowded room and just smile at the person. You both just beam because you know we're it, you know? So it's this, it's this form of exclusivity and this form of the chosen people syndrome or whatever you want to call it. But it all, in a certain sense, is very innocent, you have to think about the psychology of people who really get into this stuff. They're, they're very naive. I was incredibly naive because I was raised to be that way. The other underlying current, <laughs> I don't know why I have so many currents running through me, but that's just my phraseology, um, was I needed to learn and you're not supposed to learn outside of the Jehovah's Witness organization, um, you know, And but I did. Um, I was homeschooled, like I said. My favorite part of high school education was mythology and literature. You know, so that tells you something about my personality and my character. I loved going to the library. I loved going to Barnes & Noble. My mother was always very, very careful. And so was my father if he ever caught wind of what I was looking up or what I was researching or the books I was bringing home. Um, but that rarely happened. You know, I just wanted to know about stuff. So at a certain time when uh, my mother started working for my dad at his shop, they would both be gone. I think you have to be like 11 or 12 years old, or at least you used to be in California, in order to be left home alone as a child. Uh, so as soon as I was old enough and that started happening, my mom would go to work with my dad. And she was his secretary, and she was his bookkeeper, and all of that. Which left little old me, home alone, by myself, solo, to read whatever the fuck I wanted. And my dad just happened to have a copy of the Encyclopedia Britannica. 
and I freaking tore that thing apart, man. Especially, ding, 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 the parts on homosexuality, <laughs> on uh, deviant behavior, as it was called, you know, deviant sexual behavior. It's just like, you know, any kid who's burgeoning as a sexual being is going to be curious about that kind of stuff. You know, it's not like I was getting off on it or something, but like there was just, I needed to know. I also read the other parts of it and I wanted to know about other stuff, but that was the one I always went back to, you know, because porn was not as freely available uh, as it is these days. And so, yeah, curiosity killed the marshal. And it's really interesting to me that as a pretty devout Jehovah's Witness family, we even had an encyclopedia. Then came the days of things like the Encarta Encyclopedia, which was before Wikipedia, and it came on a CD, and I installed it, and I read absolutely every article that was in, in that thing. So I just always had this deep, insatiable desire to learn, to know more, to increase in knowledge, you know? And I think if you have that tendency as somebody who is within any cult organization or within any organization that tries to pigeonhole its members, that tries to keep them away from any other type of influence or experience or learning or whatever, it's eventually going to get the better of you. You cannot fight the urge to know more. Like, really, I think... That might be one of the most basic things that defines us as human, that defines the human spirit, you know. So eventually, those trips to Barnes & Noble and those trips to the library led me to getting things, materials, books, that my parents would not have wanted me to have. There were also programs on TV. There was this one, it was a mysterious something, I can't remember what it was, uh, and I watched every single episode of that show and they would cover things like uh, hauntings, spirits, ghosts, uh, UFOs, aliens, um, spiritual practices that I had never heard of. I was introduced to the concept of chi for the first time and energy. And it literally shows some like Shaolin monk, you know, directing his chi at some tissue paper and causing it to catch on fire. I was like, this is it. This is what I need. This is the magic that I've been looking for. This is the power. Well, of course, back then, I thought it was the power of the mind. And I was still convinced that Jehovah, my word for God, you know, wanted us as humans to develop our mental faculties to their fullest extent. And so I thought this was still within the purview of being a Jehovah's Witness. I thought I could still be a witness or a Christian or whatever and explore the powers of the mind. God gave me this mind. If it's able to do these things, he must want me to use it. You know, it just it just made sense to me. So eventually it got more serious and I started exploring things like astral projection and out-of-body experiences. My mother would have... Ooh, like you have no idea once um long after all the things that i'm describing right now she did find some books of mine that were on very simple almost spiritual uh, you know psychic phenomena esp type stuff one book was on psychometry which means picking up an object and sensing the energy and knowing information about that particular object or knowing information about the person who has held that object or who it belongs to, blah, 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 blah. Basically, you can read the history of an object or a thing just by touching it. Uh, and another was reading the human aura. Pretty freaking simple. Also, the exercises in it were so basic. They were basically just like, relax your eyes and, you know, look uh, at the thing and stare and you'll start to see colors. You know, it was really super basic. <laughs> they were just tiny little paperbacks. My mom found these books and she threw a fit. She was convinced that they would not burn because they were possessed by demons. 
Okay, that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about naive people and the psychology of these people that is just, just behind everything that we do. I was not allowed to play with troll dolls. Remember those weird things from like the 80s and 90s? Because they were also thought to be possessed by demons for some weird witnessy reason. Okay, so witnesses claim to be non-superstitious. They do. They are vehement about that. And yet, at the same time, I was told that kids had had experiences where these troll dolls would come alive and try to strangle them. Does that not sound like a superstition? Like, freaking crazy, you know? Ouija boards were evil, and they did not burn. My mom, again, would tell me a story about how she and her brothers and sisters had a Ouija board and they tried to burn it, and it wouldn't burn. So they all freaked out, because obviously it was possessed by demons and the devil and stuff. Uh, I'm thinking it was probably made of some kind of composite plastic and didn't burn well? You know what I mean? Naive! You basic! Okay, so eventually, in my quest for knowledge, I thought it would be a really great idea, somehow to start reading about and studying philosophy and psychology. This is eventually, at this point, I'm, you know, I'm like 15, 16 years old. I left the organization when I was 18 years old. I did almost get kicked out of my house when I was 17 years old because I fell in love with a boy, and he loved me too. That was my first love, Christopher. Uh, we met at a community college ASL, American Sign Language, course. <laughs> oh my god, it seems so stupid now. But it was adorable and beautiful, and we really did love each other as, you know, a 17-year-old and a and a 20-year-old, or whatever he was, uh, can do. And my parents found out, and they said, get out. You have to leave, or you have to stop seeing him completely and be a good Jehovah's Witness. So at 17 years old, I was faced with that choice, you know, go out into a world about which you know nothing. We have prepared you in no way for the experience out there. Everything out there is evil. All the people will just use you. They're all evil too. Um, it's just death, 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 drugs, 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 violence and guns. That's your picture of the world with a capital W when you're raised as a Jehovah's Witness. All right. And so obviously I said, you know, while I'm collapsed on the floor crying in a puddle of my own tears uh, that I would never see him again. And I did try to be a good witness and I did try not to talk to him for a pretty long time. Then, after a while, you know, because of what I was studying at the time, again, I was studying a lot of philosophy, I was studying a lot of psychology, I started to realize, you know what, oh, and I also started to study comparative religions as well, you know, uh, other forms of spirituality, other forms of thinking about God and the divine and, you know, spiritual service and, and all of that. And at that point, I was basically Nietzschean. <laughs> And I thought, you know what? This God is dead to me. My my whole little line of thinking that got me through it was God is love. He who has not come to know love has not come to know God because God is love. It's in the Bible. Look it up. And I've been taught that my entire life. I fell in love with a man. You know, regardless of all the sexy stuff, there was no sexy stuff. We had kissed, and it was lovely, but we never did anything, because I was anything else, because I was still a Jehovah's Witness in my mind, and that was the right way to be. But the love was pure. The love was there, and I could not deny the love. And according to Bible math, that was God. Pretty fucking simple. So at that point, I realized this is the most, this was the most intense experience I had ever had, the most intense feelings of love I had ever had, even in comparison to my love for God and my love for everything that was sacred and holy and wonderful and good. And I decided, no, this is not for me. 
I know too much. <laughs> I know too much. I've experienced too much. And I kissed those lips. I, I did not know. You know, yeah, there was like sexual desire behind it. But it wasn't all lust. I was in love with this guy. We would just spend hours and hours and hours on the phone talking about poetry and music and, and the movies that we liked and the, the characters that we respected and all this cool stuff, you know. We were inspiring to each other in a very loving and supportive way. And it was one of the best times of my entire life, honestly. Until the axe fell. And I was given the ultimatum to either stop seeing him or get out. So for a time, I tried to do my best to be a good witness, and then I just couldn't anymore because I had this experience. At that point, my mom was more used to the idea and said I could still stay in the house even though I wasn't a witness. And, you know, I just had to not bring worldly people around. I had to, you know, not have sex in the house, obviously. I don't know. And the other thing was that I had to get a job or at least find a career path so I could get out of the house as soon as possible. So I decided I wanted to be a court reporter. I got enrolled into court reporting school, and that was the focus of my life for the next four years. Um, again, I had no other plans. I had no idea how to get... I still don't really know how to get out there in the world. I still feel so weird. I still feel like a little squishy blob when I try to get out in the world and do something or just like go get a job or whatever the case may be. It's just, I, I was never introduced to any of that stuff. And then during this time was the most prolific reading and studying period probably of my entire life. So I talked about the thirst for knowledge. I talked about the spiritual, you know, desire that I had, that scholarly desire to know more and to get closer to God and to study different spiritualities. This was times 10. I was going down to the San Diego Public Library. I was going to the Escondido Public Library where I grew up. And I was reading everything about shamanism, about yoga, about psychedelic experiences, about the Mayan calendar. That stuff started to blow up right around then. And so I found Maya Cosmogenesis 2012. And I was like, dude, this is blowing my mind, man. And of course, I started smoking weed. I had my first mushroom experience in Santa Cruz, California. By that time, I had a different boyfriend. And we were actually boyfriends, you know, we were sexually active, we saw each other every weekend, um, even though he was in LA, I was in San Diego, and he went to college in a magical, mystical land called Santa Cruz, California, and I went up to visit him one time, and he pulled out some mushrooms, and I was like, I've never done this before, and I think that's, in some ways, I'm not recommending this, but in some ways, that is the best set to go into a psychedelic experience with it has to be with people you trust it has to be in a place where you feel comfortable and all of that and you're not going to get into any trouble or anything bad is going to happen so we took mushrooms and we just walk out into this amazing meadow on campus where everything was green and foresty and beautiful and it was just full of you know magical dancing hippies and we go into the forest, and it was just me and him. We're kind of like sitting there, like meditating ishness stuff. And we had kind of like telepathic experiences. My whole mind was opened up, my body was opened up. It was absolutely beatific, you know? The most glowing mushroom experience of I've, I've ever had. And it was not a large dose. Since then, my mushroom experiences have not been very pleasant. So I'm not saying that this is the way to go or whatever. I think it is. it can be a powerful medicine. It is a powerful medicine if you use it in the right way. But this one experience is really what propelled me on to my spiritual path for many, 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 many years. All right. So I started really researching the shamanic stuff. I got obsessed with Terrence McKenna. I thought he was the mushroom god, you know, and I really wish I hadn't because I'm no longer a fan of his because he really doesn't talk about anything sacred except the psychedelic experience. Uh, I think he had some interesting ideas. They all pretty much turned out to be hogwash. 
Uh, I don't agree with his method anymore, which was to take five dried grams of mushrooms, sit in a completely dark room by yourself, and smoke hella weed. Like, that's one thing. He, he would recommend you just do the mushrooms, and you can talk to this entity. This thing, yeah, The mushroom spirit is going to talk to you, and that it's, you know, dancing in the mystery, or whatever he called it. And that's all great. But most people don't have the experiences he describes on just five dried grams of mushrooms. They just don't. Uh, I've never seen anything. I've never seen a, so much as a purple dot. And I've done at least seven grams of dried mushrooms before. Nothing. Okay? I never hear a voice. I never hear the mushroom talking to me. I really think that it was just like his thing. Also, he doesn't include the fact that he just smokes joint after joint after joint after joint while he's doing this mushroom experience. That is not a mushroom experience. That is a mushroom and cannabis experience. And these things must be synergistic, right? And so that propels the experience to a completely different level. And he never really broached that, at least not on any of the lectures that I had ever heard of his, and I've listened to all of them, okay? I had every single one of his books in my trunk, just in case, for a very long time. I really wish I had known who the hell Alan Watts was at that point in my life, because it would have propelled me on a more obviously spiritual path, you know? But I was obsessed with the mushroom experience for a very long time and convinced that all I had to do was take this supposed sacrament and I could wake up. I could talk to God, you know. And I don't think that's the right approach to take with psychedelics, to be honest. Around this time, I also started reading Carlos Castaneda, which you will hear me reference the Toltec tradition and Nahuelismo, or Nahualism, or I will use the term Nahual or Nahual. Uh, people pronounce it differently at different times. I've heard the same person pronounce it differently at different times. Um, obviously, it's spelled with a G in the classic Spanish or Mexican spelling, um, but from the Nahuatl language, it is spelled with an H. Fascinatingly, I didn't really know that the Carlos Castaneda literature was in the Toltec tradition or lineage or the tradition of the Mexica, which is obviously where the word Mexican or Mexico comes from, you know, until much, much later in my spiritual journey. I don't know how I missed that necessarily, but it did not seem particularly prevalent in the Carlos Castaneda literature that I read. And I was obsessed for a while. I was devouring all the books, and I got it in my head. This is what I sort of call my shamanic initiation period, because if you know anything about a Nahual as a person who is sort of bending reality, everything else that they do, everything that they create, everything that they produce, even the spoken word or the written word, is essentially a performance piece. And it is also intended to take the listener or the reader into a separate reality. And that is obviously the title of one of Castaneda's books. You're welcome. So I believe and feel very strongly that I was activated, to use a sort of new age term, by the stuff that I was reading. I don't think it can work any other way. I think people are, are really starting to understand just how sensitive we are, how empathic we are, that consciousness is really non-local, and that just by reading something, we, we take it into ourselves. We sort of become the things that we're reading or the things that we're watching. You know, I've, I've had it, the more sensitive I get, I've had it happen to me numerous times where... I'll spend time alone doing my spiritual practices, not having any contact with anyone. And then one person will come over to visit, most likely unannounced, and we'll hang out together for like an hour and have these interactions. And it's very intense for me. And then I swear to God, I cannot get them out of my head for days afterward. Their their face is in front of me. It's in my mind's eye, their smell, their... You know, their energy is just everywhere. And I'm just like, God, I understand now. This is several years ago, maybe five, six years ago uh, at this point that I finally started to understand why monks monk out and why hermits hermit. 
you know? So I believe that I was being activated by this literature, however I took it and whatever I took it to mean. To me, it was just very mysterious and, and weird. But I started to, when I would go for walks, by this time I'm in my early to mid-20s, living in Riverside, California, and I would go on walks with my then-current partner up uh, Mount Rubidoux. We lived right next to it, so we would walk up it, and that's where everybody walked. It was just a big pile of dust. No offense to any Riversidians or anything, or to Californians in general, but in general, California, or at least Southern California, does not know mountains. Not the way that I know mountains now, considering that at this point in my life, I have lived at 9,500 feet above sea level in a tiny cabin in the forest in rural Colorado. All right, so I consider myself to know mountains now, now and that ain't it. <clears throat> Regardless of that fact, we used to walk up this pile of dust, a.k.a. mountain, and for whatever reason, that's where my shamanic initiation started taking form. You had to circle or spiral around the mountain, and obviously I'm a very shy and awkward person, even though I was kind of cute back then, and I would avoid eye contact with everybody. And so I was just sitting there. And sometimes I would hold mudras in my hands to like keep my energy in. And I was obsessed with the idea that, that Carlos Castaneda talked about. Or he talked about Don Juan talking about. Which was that you leak energy out of your body. Especially when you're walking. And you're supposed to like hold loose fists as you're walking. And you're supposed to do this like warrior's walk. And I would do that to the best of my ability and spiral up this mountain. And for whatever reason, I was also obsessed with the idea that everything was significant. So, you know, if I saw a bird flying left, then that was a sign. And I had to sort of like keep it in my consciousness to, to, to wake up to the meaning of it, you know. But back then, I do not feel this way now. But back then, I was trying to interpret what that symbol meant. You know, that's really not what the point of that kind of stuff is if I'm being honest, but back then that's what I thought it was, and so that was significant. If somebody passed me and made eye contact with me and we had a moment or whatever in passing, then that person might have been, you know, significant to me in a past life, or maybe they were my enemy and they were trying to magically attack me or something like that, or maybe they weren't a real person at all, you know, and all this weird shamanic stuff that goes through your head when you become obsessed with that kind of stuff. And so weird, strange, you know, kooky as it may have been, it still was a sort of shamanic experience for me, a shamanic awakening. And eventually I calmed down and I started exploring other things. I also want to be clear that it's really difficult to speak of the different periods of my life, the different types of spiritual investigation compartmentalized. I was studying all the things, all the time, all at once, always, already. So next time I'd like to talk about what I consider my actual spiritual awakening, or you could think of it as an activation, or an empowerment, when I actually started to experience altered states of consciousness through meditation and trance work, through magical work, when I started to have experiences of divine bliss and ecstasy, when I started to have channeling experiences and could actually feel other types of consciousness enter into my own, into my field. And that all started to happen when I began engaging in two specific practices. One I now call Yigong. The other is the Akadawa. So I'd just like to end by reminding people that if you sign up for Naona X on my Patreon account, you'll get one extra exclusive episode every week and access to my live streams and workshops, which all have practical applications for the types of spirituality I'm talking about, for the types of spirituality that I still practice today, specifically in the Toltec and Taoist traditions. Thank you for listening.